great to be here, uh, first event. Obviously, uh, excited to be invited, so thanks to the organizers, thanks for coming. A lot of times, people don't really look at supply chain as being all that interesting, um, which is why the title is The Silent Exponential. And yet, if you really do look at it, there's a lot of money, something we haven't talked a lot about. We've got molecules, and we've got satellites, but um, I teach in a business school, so money is really kind of important. Um, and so you can find a lot of money in supply chains, and you also can find a lot of innovations in supply chains, but supply chain people don't really trumpet this much. So let's talk about the money first. Anybody know Coyote Logistics? Nope. It's a third-party logistics provider, it's a lot of very uh, software-intensive algorithmic intensiveness, intensivity. Um, UPS bought them for $1.8 billion. Not bad for a startup exit strategy, right? That's a supply chain play. Kiva Robotics right here in Boston was bought, for, bought by Amazon in 2012 for about $775 million. Again, this is supply chain robots. This is unglamorous, but game changing. Um, a lot of stuff we're talking about, wearables. You know, wearables for fitness, wearables for medical. We've been doing wearables in supply chains for 25 years. I'll show you a picture in a second. Barcodes. Barcodes, the oldest information technology many of us can think about. That's a hyperlink. Nobody called it a hyperlink back in 1944. Lasers, satellites, autonomous vehicles. So here's the ring scanner. This is um, a wearable, a wearable computer with a sensor on it. Lots of buzzwords there. This is ancient technology in a supply chain warehouse. Here's an autonomous vehicle pilot. This started in 2009 in Europe. These are Volvo trucks in what's called a platoon. The lead truck is driven by a human driver. The following trucks have human drivers that will uh, abdicate control because the machine can sense and respond faster than the person can, which means following distances shrink, which means that they can then have better fuel economy. They take up less space. You can get more use of the roadway. Um, Big deal, very big deal. This is 2009 that this started, and it's still ongoing now. Um, the trucks are now connected by Wi-Fi. You can see the antennas on that lead truck. Let's try this. OK, so where are we going next? This is a conference about the future, not about the past. So some drivers, some implications, and some barriers. And a lot of this will touch on notes that you've already seen before. Drivers, connectivity everywhere, the fact that we can now talk about satellites, we can talk about Wi-Fi being pretty ubiquitous, certainly cellular is ubiquitous. Most of the planet has wireless coverage now. You'd never know it from being in some parts of central Pennsylvania, but in fact, wireless coverage is pretty much ubiquitous. Think about computing 50 years ago, it was in a data center, it was in a big room. 30 years ago, it was on a workstation. Now it's in our pocket. In the next five, 10 years, computing is moving out of the box into the world. Whether it's robots, you saw the beam in the innovation lab. You talk about robots um, in many um, autonomous vehicle scenarios. You can talk about 3D printing as being computation that affects the 3D world. The Nest thermostat is computing outside the box. There's lots and lots of examples. And so this is one of those exponentials where you bring Moore's Law dynamics into the physical world, lots of interesting things happen. Once we stop thinking of a computer as a beige box that sits in our desk, or a gray box that sits under our desk, and starts putting, you know, embedding computing in lots and lots of things. Finally, algorithms are getting better, taking advantage of Moore's Law, and advances in software engineering. This is often the, it's harder to draw a curve of software improvement, of algorithmic improvement. But um, we're seeing this in pricing, in shelving. Anybody know what CADEX storage is? CADEX shelving. So Amazon, if you think about going into your local uh, Dick Sporting Goods, you walk in and say, I want a size 10 Puma XYZ. And so they say, OK, we have this in blue, we have this in red, we have this in black. And so there's a, red, there's a range of the blue ones, there's a range of the black ones, and there's a range of the other uh, color. And we see that we get to, oh, there's no size 10. We have size 9.5, we have size 10.5. Amazon doesn't work that way. Anytime there's an open storage spot, there's a barcode underneath it, there's a barcode on the, on the item being sold, those are both scanned, matched, and the thing is stuck into the open slot. 
So you could have a bowling ball next to a USB stick, next to a carving knife. Doesn't matter. There's no rhyme or reason to the shelving except what's known through the barcodes. Why does this matter? They increased their storage density 50% by moving to the shelving algorithm. 50% free space. 